everyone, Andrew here from the Legend of Zelda Hub. It has been a while since we've had an episode of the Zelda Hub podcast. Uh, hope everybody is staying safe in these cr- uh, crazy and wild times. Everything with the pandemic that's going on. Everything that's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and riots and whatever the earth decides to throw at us with the six remaining months of the year. Uh, I just hope everybody is safe. But this <laughs> week, as you can just heard a little snicker there in the background, we have a special guest this week. We've uh, had a couple of us friends here before, and now we have the man himself. Say hello, Sean. Hello. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to... <laughs> I forgot that this is supposed to be your special intro, although I guess it is very fitting that the person who played Ravali would end up butting in before it was his turn to speak. Naturally. Um, I just found I found it was really funny that you mentioned, you know, it's it's been a heck of a year because um, yesterday, what? Yesterday was the first of June, right? Like we've literally yeah. just started this month. Mm-hmm. Um and yesterday, not only did my car's replacement engine start smoking and I had to pull off to the side of the road and get it towed to a service shop, uh, but later that afternoon, our transformer for the neighborhood actually caught fire. So we oh. were out of power for about three, four hours. Uh, I'm actually quite impressed with how quickly they fixed it, but a lot of us were convinced that we were going to be out of power for like three to four days because of just, you know, everything that's been going on. Um, so that was definitely that was definitely the start to the month. And as you said, it's been... It's been a year. We're only six months into 2020, but it feels like it's been six years since 2019. Yeah, 2019 feels like the before times when everything was happy and and, and innocent. And now here we are, eight years into 2020. Hell yeah. I always kind of look at it this way, though. It can be worse. It can still be worse. I am actually somewhat mad at you for saying that phrase because you have invited the cosmos to make it so. <laughs> it's in the world now. <laughs> uh, for, for those of I'm, you I'm who are new to the, uh, it's worse. to the podcast, in the past, I've had a couple of Sean's friends here. Some of you may remember Joe Hernandez. He is the voice of Daruk and... Uh, Inobo, I never say that guy's na- name right. He's the. Other... I, I believe Inobo is correct. I think you got it right. Joe is a great guy. We had a lot of fun with Joe, and I'm still friends with Joe. We talk a lot. Uh, we're we're baseball and wrestling buddies. Uh, and then uh, we had Elizabeth Maxwell too, who was the voice of Barbosa and Riju, the Gerudo champion. And she was an absolute class act to have on the she's show. She's so good in that game too. Like her performance is stellar. Oh, she's awesome. Uh, I, I've always been a huge fan of the Gerudo race a, as a whole throughout the series, and she absolutely captured how I would envision a mm-hmm. Gerudo leader. I agree. I agree. Uh, we've also worked with a little, a little bit with Patricia Somerset, uh, the voice of the princess Zelda herself. Very, very you know, she nice taught- lady. She taught herself how to write in Hillian. Like she, when she does autographs for people, she will actually write messages in the Hillian uh, text language. That is amazing. Yeah, I don't know one letter of it, and I've played Zelda since nineteen eighty seven. I I barely remember uh, most of my lessons from my Japanese minor in college, and here Patricia <laughs> is memorizing an entire uh, virtual world language. <laughs> That is amazing. Imagine if somebody learned the uh, Tolkien Elvish language. That would be, I'm pretty sure somebody has. Oh, I'm sure plenty of people have. I I love Lord of the Rings, but I never got that deep into it. Um, Right. And and we've also got uh, next week's episode, spoilers. Uh, We're going to have Amelia Gotham, the voice of Mipha, everybody's favorite cute little Zora. Good on you, dude. Like, she really deserves more attention when it comes to this game. And I couldn't even begin to describe to you the reason why. But for some reason, it feels like she just gets left out of a lot of these opportunities. I don't know if it's because, like, she – there's no real reason – oh, yeah, because, like – 
Sidon, uh, most of the major champions, Mifa's one of the actual champions, and so yeah. many people interview Daruk, you know, Rivali, or Bosa, but I never see as many for Mifa, and, and I don't know what the reason for that is, and I consider her one of the strongest, if not the strongest, champion performance in the DLC. Um, just the way that she embodied that character's, like, nervous confidence, I, it's just a shame. So good on you, dude, and I'm very, very glad that you could get her involved on this, along with everyone else. Yeah, we've been working with her. We have a uh, Facebook group, and it's pretty, pretty big group, and she joined, and we worked with her, um, and she sent out a bunch of autographs to people. I got one myself. Oh. Uh, you know, she, she, uh, she's a very nice, she'll talk to anybody. She'll take time out for you. You know, she's absolutely wonderful human being. And I can, I very much look forward to next week when we have her on, we're actually going to be recording two days after this. And then the episode will go up next Wednesday. For sure. But yeah, we, we're here though, to talk about, your experiences with this you actually you're kind of the busy body of the group because you did three characters right i did uh and i i've said this a couple times but i don't think it's public knowledge yet but actually the great deku tree was originally the only role that i was cast as even though uh a lot of people rightfully say and i agree uh i consider it the weakest of my three performances if we want to critique them um, but originally it was only the Great Deku Tree, and then in the process of recording the Great Deku Tree was when we had an opportunity for me to read samples for Rivali, and I ended up getting double assigned, and then along the way for Rivali, they said, we have this other Rito that we still need a voice for. Are you able to do something that's distinctly different from both Rivali and the Great Deku Tree? So I did, and they said, yep, that's different enough, and it's exactly what we envisioned for them, and that's how I ended up with a third role. Now, something we have learned through our friends um, that you guys, when you guys are recording these parts initially, you don't know anything about what game you're, you didn't, you didn't know this was Zelda. You didn't know that you were going to be the great Deku tree or a Rito warrior. Oh my God. Uh, for the longest time, I had no idea because uh, everything was codenamed as you know. And when we, when I originally auditioned for the game, um, I, because of the code names, I thought it was for, um, a, uh, a Dragon Quest game. Oh, that would have um, cool, Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to give any details on what the code names were, just because I don't, I don't know how much I'm allowed to share, but it's right. pretty common knowledge that a lot of stuff will get code name. But just because of the way that the names were spelled or certain terms that were being used, it was like, oh, this has got to be for, like, an, an upcoming Dragon Quest game or something like that. And the funniest thing that ever happened is I remember when I did the callback auditions, they had some some concept artwork for some of the characters to give you an idea of what, like, that race looked like. And I remember looking at one of the character concept arts, and I <laughs> I turned to the guy who was going to be directing me for, for the callback, and I said, do you know what this reminds me of? Zant from Twilight Princess. This oh, is wow. really giving me some Zant vibes right now. And I had no idea at the time that it was for Legend of Zelda. Um, now, I'm trying to remember. Uh, at the time, I'm trying to remember when, because when I got the notification that I was going to be recording and they gave me the official name of the character, I knew that I freaked out, but I don't remember if that was because I had seen the name of the character during a previous session, or if that was because at the time we knew what some of the characters were named. Did they ever reveal the names of the champions prior to the game coming out? Oh man, that's four years ago. Um, yeah. They okay, may guess... have. Nintendo is so secretive about literally I mean, everything. Is... I want to say that I, I, by the time I not I was notified that my recording session was going to include Rivali, that... Um, uh, that I had already known who what Rivali's name was, and I was already in the middle of recording. But the Great Deku Tree was definitely one of those cases where, before I came in for recording, I had been thinking back on like the auditions and the code names, and I thought about one specific code name, and I thought about recent news articles, and I went, wait, 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 wait. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. It can't be possible because there's no, that franchise has never had voices before. But this lines up with 
no way. And then when I came in and they ended up confirming that it was for The Legend of Zelda, that's when I had like that that epiphany oh. moment of you you figured it out before they told you, but holy crap, this is actually happening. Yeah, that that is awesome. I mean, and the Great Deku Tree is such a legendary figure in the series going all the way back to the 90s with Ocarina of Time and to be able to give personality and voice to this this almost legendary figure in Nintendo lore I mean, that that's got to really grab you yeah for sure i've described to a lot of people that uh, uh especially in regards to the Legend of Zelda is really big about lore, and I've said that Breath of the Wild kind of reminds me of Mad Max, where uh, it's not really about Link's story. It's about the stories and the lives of everyone else in the world, and that's why you're a silent protagonist going through and experiencing it alongside them and helping them out before going on your way. And that's kind of consistent throughout the entire franchise, to be perfectly honest. Link, it's never really about Link's story. It's about this this otherworldly entity being revived or you know whatever the lore is for for uh the hero of time or the hero of the of legend being brought back over and over again it's so that we can experience all these new worlds and all these new races and all these new um uh personal backstories and feel like we're taking part in helping them survive that's a really good analogy i've never heard a mad max comparison to zelda before but that nails it right, right, right on the on the nose. I, I, I mean, at the time, the reason why I made that instant comparison was because it was released around the same time as Persona Five, and Persona Five was an example where the story was centered on the main cast. It was about these kids, these phantom thieves, and the struggles that they were going through, um, and how they used that to fight against the villains of the game. Whereas Breath of the Wild, the character that you control, has almost no say in the situation. It's almost entirely about everyone else around them. Um, and so it was easy for me to make that comparison where you're not you're not living the lives of the characters you're playing as you're living vicariously through everyone else that you're helping out. That's a really good point. Now, before Breath of the Wild came out, as you mentioned before, voice acting hadn't really been done in a proper Zelda game. The most that we'd ever got was either like grunts or haze or listens from you know, one words from different characters. And then we got Hyrule Warriors, which had a narrator, which blew the Zelda community through the roof. It's like, whoa, somebody's I talking. Forgot. I actually forgot that it had a narrator, but you're right. I actually think, and I'm not 100% sure on this. One of these days I'm going to sit down, because i got two TVs really close to each other. And something I want to do. I have speculated for the last couple of years that they changed the narrator's voice from the Wii U version and then into the Switch version. Oh? I think they sound different. It might just be because the Switch is, like, higher res. You know, I don't think you're crazy. There, For some reason, like, I don't remember much, but there's some part of me that swears either I saw someone talk about that previously or I myself thought that previously. But for some reason, you bringing this up is not the first time I've heard of it. So you yeah. might not be insane. I'm going to do that one day. I'll make that a project one day. I might like do a special video of me pulling out, just like pull out my camera phone and just be like, okay, we're going to do this. It's going to be like Geraldo Rivera with the, uh, what was it? The mummy's tomb. <laughs> Right. Yeah, you're much younger than me. You might not have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I'm an old man. I'm thir- I'm, I'm going to be 39 in like two months. So I make a lot of outdated references. <laughs> um, yeah, we got to Hyrule Warriors and we got the narrator. That blew everybody's gasket. Everybody was like, whoa, cool. Uh, do more, please. Because for so right. many years, it's like this outdated read the text and the character's kind of just standing there awkwardly while you read this. And you got to smash buttons. If you've done played the game, you don't want to sit there and read it again. And it's just like, come on. Every other big franchise has, you, you know, voice acting. And when's Zelda going to do it? So when it was announced, I can remember when I posted it, when I when I wrote the article. At the time, I was working for... Zelda Dungeon. Mm-hmm. 
and I remember posting the article, and it just blew up. Oh, we hope it's going to be actual good act voice acting and not Super Mario Sunshine quality. I don't. Know I mean, you... I was definitely, I was definitely afraid when I heard that Breath of the Wild was going to be getting voice acting because you know everyone was like, "You must have been so excited, you must have been so eager," and I was like, "Uh, no," because the last time Legend of Zelda had any proper voice acting, it became a meme on the internet for twenty <laughs> years. What are you talking about? Well, uh, I was not. Excuse me. Right. Well, I, you know, I, I think people enjoyed. I think a lot of people actually enjoyed the voice acting of the of the Zelda show because that kind of fit within the narrative of of '90s television and like per character performance styles. Yeah. I mean more in regards to the CDI games because oh. we're talking specifically video games. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and. People were like, you must have been so happy to voice. I was like, no, I was not able to breathe a sigh of relief until after the game had come out. And the audience response was not, holy crap, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. Why did they ever bother bringing voice acting back? So, As a <laughs> child of the 80s, I grew up with literally all of it. So, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, I'm, I see, it came out in like, I want to think 89 was when the Zelda cartoon came out. Maybe 90. It, it was right, not too long after they debuted the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. And I remember absolutely loving it. Younger fans don't like it because a lot of younger fans are into anime. And, you know, they have a higher expectation. Right. In the 80s, we dealt with a lot of crappy cartoons. Oh, God, we dealt with a lot of just... So many Ninja Turtle knockoffs. I, I've had four-hour discussions with friends about this. I'm going to do a podcast on it one day about bad cartoons. And I have and I remember when I first saw the Zelda cartoon, I'm like, this is awesome. I didn't expect Link to act like that, but like, yeah, he was pretty much... That was I typical thoroughly of, enjoyed of it. Heroes. Yeah, he was pretty much no different than Captain N or a lot of male leads in cartoons at the time he was the right arrogant i'm so cool man you know like, that whoa. was that was pretty that was pretty universal for the 90s was this sense of um uh being too cool for the environment too cool for school yeah you know it was in commercials as well like you got you want to drink capri sun to be rad you want to be more <laughs> rad than other people so it makes sense that in order to make the main character of these video game adaptations relatable that they would make them kind of fourth wall breaking in that yeah you know i'm a hero but i'm too cool for all of this you know this villain trying to wreak havoc on my world is more of an annoyance than a threat does that make sense oh yeah. um so, so it fit within the narrative of that time. So I don't, I don't blame it for going for that camp kind of, you know, let's, let's laugh along with the audience at how ridiculous this all is. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned the, the games that a lot of fans don't like to mention the CDI games and they have a cult following. They're fun to make fun of because they're just absolutely atrocious vile, disgusting things that we like to point and laugh at. Right. Um, I'll never for the life of me understand. Like, the, you got to think of it like this. Here's Philips. At the time, this huge company, and they're working with the biggest video game developers in the world, Nintendo, and they're going to develop their next console for them. Remember, for those of you who don't know, Nintendo chose Philips over Sony. Uh -huh. And as a result, Sony went on to make the PlayStation. That was going to be the Nintendo PlayStation. That's right. I do recall that. So instead, we got the Philips CDI. And um, it is only known for really, really awful video games. And not just Zeldas. There's a thing called Hotel Mario that... Uh, yep, yep. Nice. I actually, I didn't realize this, but one of the studios that I work at, Mark Grau Recording Studios, Mark Grau is the guy who voiced Mario in Hotel Mario. Whoa. So, for the for years, I've been doing consistent work at a studio headed by the, by the guy, infamous for going, all toasters, toast, toast. So. <laughs> That's amazing. You flash forward, you know, for so many years, Nintendo 
once again, they're, they're apprehensive about using voice acting because they got burnt, and understandably. And then the next time, like, with one of their big titles, you know, Star Fox had a lot of voice acting. You know, it was kind of simple. You know, some voice acting was great. Some of it probably right. wasn't so great. But it was an experimental time. And then the next time we see voice acting in one of their big titles is Super Mario Sunshine. And that's one everybody right. raises their eyebrows on. You've got I it. forget. I totally forget that Super Mario Sunshine had voice acting. Every time that I watch a playthrough of that game or a speed run and I hear Flood talking or I hear Peach talking, I'm like, wait, what? What? And dear God, Leslie Swan, I know she's done a lot of work for Nintendo over the years. God bless her. I don't know Leslie myself, and I can't speak on her. But I have nothing bad to say about her as a human being. But gosh, that those lines as Princess Peach not only were terribly written, were awfully delivered. Mm. Uh, just the, the whole line of, I'm your mama? Just Peach. Eh. I mean, it's something it, part you of that know. could also... You, you have to understand that voice actors are also at the behest of their directors as yeah. well. Um, one of the things that there's a there was an E3 trailer for Harvest Moon Sky Tree Village that I share a lot because, it, you know, again, I don't fault the voice actor, but the delivery is very much like this. And it's clear that it's a promotional video. It doesn't sound realistic at all. Yeah, it does not sound authentic at all. But I can't blame them because you have to understand when we go into the studio, when we record, there are two main people that get to dictate how we say things like, you know, different directors will give different amounts of leniency in regards to how we deliver a line. Right. But ultimately we are at the behest of the client who hired us to represent their character on their property. So if they want it done a certain way, that's how they're going to get it done. And the director for the studio who's responsible for cutting our checks. So if we want to keep working, you know, obviously we can suggest ideas or say, well, I, I saw the character this way and I'd like to try this. We can suggest that. But at the end of the day, if we want to get paid, we're going to deliver the line with the context given to us by the client and the director and make them happy. So yeah, that's a hundred percent understandable. It's just like, uh, it's like any other walk of life. You, you, if you're working in McDonald's and the manager wants the meat cooked on one side only. He wants it seared. That's how you got to do it. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty much with any job and, or probably a better analogy would be like at Wendy's where they tell you to specifically cook each side of the burger for a set amount of time. You yes. know, there might be customers, there might be customers that are like, you know, I don't like the meat being cooked this much. I want it a little more rare. Well, that's great. I'm sorry. You're disappointed, but you don't decide whether I get paid or not. My boss does. And my boss says cook it for 20 seconds every side. So that's what I'm doing. That's a great analogy. And I worked for Wendy's for two years as a cook. And I've heard that many times. I'll get customers. Since like, you've worked for Wendy's, since you've worked for Wendy's, I have to ask, what are your thoughts on the hot drinks video? Oh, that's a legendary one. <laughs> hot drinks really <laughs> get you going. <laughs> They're legendary, man. Sometimes, like, if I can't sleep and it's, like, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I will throw those kind of videos on just to, to put myself in a better mood or something. I want to see – I would love to see an interview, like, a where are they now type thing from the guy who did those – who was yes. the performer in those videos. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Those are <laughs> those are hilarious. Gosh, you gotta think of the mindset. That's a that's eighties, late eighties, early nineties, too. And just imagine if, if if Wendy's and and Wendy's Twitter game has always been so good. They've really connected with an audience really well. Imagine a commercial like that now. Like like that would really hit <laughs> home. People would like well, that sure. if they like did a throwback. Uh, so, so I, I sent you a link. I sent you a link that you can check out later. But I think I found a follow up interview with the guy who was in the Wendy's video. That's awesome. So you know, we we got we graduated from Super Mario Sunshine's eh, performance, shall we say? And like you said, the voice actors and actresses can only do what they are told. There's only so much creative direction you guys can take before someone says, okay, no, not like this. you got to do it like this. 
Right. Now, one of the things I've noticed, having run Zelda websites, Facebook pages, groups, Twitters, etc., for almost 10 years, one thing that I know about Zelda fans is they're amazing human beings, and I love them. I cherish them, and they're the reason that I wake up every day. But they can also be very critical, and they don't hold back because they want what's best for what they view as the best video game series in the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I hear on Breath of the Wild, people do criticize a lot of the dialogue and some of the voice acting. Have you ever encountered any of that from fans? So, I mean, of course, as voice actors, we want to know if what we're doing is entertaining people. So whether it's sent to us or whether we find it ourselves, we're inevitably going to get feedback from both sides of the spectrum. Um, And part of the reason why I try – I personally look at whether the the criticism is constructive or not. Like if it's something where – I know that I could improve on that skill set or, you know, if, if it's something where they feel like it didn't match a character's tonality, you know, I can be better about my background research. I can be better about um, understanding the emotional context or being willing to make myself vulnerable so that I can be more authentic. Uh, but I also have to understand the limitations of my job. So like I mentioned, there's always the, you know, ultimately I have to do what the client is asking me to do, even if it's at odds with how I see the character. Um, but also it depends on, uh, what development is or or how extensive the development is on accommodating for the English uh, narration. Right. Perfect example being Kingdom Hearts is well known in terms of voiceover because they actually re uh, uh, they 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 redo the character model lip flaps based on the dub that's being used. Mm-hmm. So the Japanese lip flaps match the Japanese, the English lip flaps match the English. If you look at an example like, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, uh, <laughs> the lip flaps only match the... I remember playing it constantly in English over and over and over and over again. I'm one of those people that raised like an ultimate hero chow. So I had put in the hours for the game. So I know just as well as anyone else about how horribly the English voiceover mismatched the lip flaps. And then one day, because I was bored, I decided to play it with Japanese voices. And the instant awareness of how perfectly the Japanese performance matched the lip flaps every single time opened my eyes to how that sort of thing happens. Uh, An example Mm. that I give to people from my own performance is Great Deku Tree. Uh, If you remember the line where he goes, many have referred to me throughout the ages as the Deku Tree. There is a weird pause in the Japanese uh, that fits with the way that the Eng- the Japanese text was written, but it leads to an awkward pause in the English where you can, if you go back and you listen to the line, you'll hear me go, many have referred to me throughout the ages as the Deku tree. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, so that is purely because we were required to do, to exactly match the lip flaps as they appear on screen. So when you hit this point where the the adapted script has to honor the message that the original Japanese script says, but it also has to match the timing of the lip flaps. It can create awkward situations like that if they're not going to edit the in-game models to make the lip flaps match the different language. Um, So that's why this this is a very long tangent to go on uh, as it relates to uh, your original question, which was critique from people online. But it's one of those it's one of those behind the scenes things where I take a lot of critique seriously. I want to always make sure I'm giving a good performance, but I also keep in mind what limitations I was working through that may not be obvious to the people who are only playing the finished product. Um, Another example is, like, uh, when I did the DLC for Ravali, we didn't know about the DLC ahead of time. Like, we found out about the DLC coming to Breath of the Wild at the same time as everyone else. But I wish I had known about the stuff that we learned about in the DLC for Ravali before I'd recorded for the original game. Because it would have made so much more sense regarding why he was acting the way he was towards Link. And I think it would have helped me with my performance and also possibly helped me avoid uh it's no secret that Rivali gave me a lot of trouble because I didn't understand his character mentality I didn't understand why I was being directed in a certain direction 
uh, regarding his attitude. And now, I, you know, I hit it, and now I understand why they directed me there, and I'm glad I was able to do it even though I didn't understand at the time. But it would have saved me so much frustration if I could have gone into that original game recording and understood the bitterness that Rivali felt towards Link um, and understood the trials that Rivali had put himself through by the time I was looking at that script for the first time. So... <laughs> sometimes sometimes the sometimes the criticism is entirely valid but yeah. the reason why the performance ended up that way was due to factors outside of my control and uh, one of the um biggest complaints that i see is and i've spoke with her about this um privately before and that's patricia's uh, she seems to get the blunt of it all uh, and mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff you just said kind of opened my eyes a little too here where you talk about having to match lips and stuff, people don't, people should also think when it comes with her, she was also having to work with an accent that wasn't normal for her. She had to speak with a British accent and do all that stuff you said. So, mm -hmm. you know, that would probably make things even worse for her as far as having to match lips and stuff to and, and try to do an accent as well. Mm -hmm. um, so... One of my favorite uh, favorite characters in this entire game is a character that a lot of people don't mention. And he is one of yours. I absolutely loved Teba. Teba is a very special... Like, people ask, who is your favorite character that you played in Breath of the Wild? And I do like Rivali, but... I, if we want to talk about personal importance, I actually think Teba is the most important to me of the three um, because Teba's voice was inspired by a character voice that I did for a separate series. There was this animated series called The Bedfellows uh, that existed online featuring two characters, Sheen and Fatigue. Um, and Sheen's, um, you know, Sheen's normal voice is just angry all the time. He's just, uh, he's grinding his teeth. He's pissed off at everything. And when it came time to do the voice for Teba, I they they gave me the basic description that he was very, you know, he's he's the the spiritual successor. You know, if if Sidon is that to Mipha, if Unobo is that to Daruk, then Teba is that to Rivali. Yeah. Um, and Teba's personality is that he's he's not he doesn't think Link is incapable. He's just I'm already dealing with so much, and I'm not sure I can trust you until you've proven yourself to me. It wasn't rejection. It's uh, uh, I'm not gonna just sign on to this until I have confidence I can wow. I can trust you. Otherwise, I'm gonna take this all on myself. So I thought, what if I took the 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 anger and the and the grittiness from from Sheen from Bedfellows, and instead of anger, it was just stress. It was just bitterness. It was just un unsurety, and I'm keeping my voice low because I'm not sure if what I have is enough. And that's Teba. Teba, and that's how Teba came to life. Um, it was literally just redirecting the the furrowed eyebrows from anger into bitterness or 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 concern. Um, and that was a case where you know with Rivali, I came in with an idea of the character, and it didn't match up with what Nintendo wanted, so we had to go in a different direction. With Deku Tree. I wasn't able to do the voice that they had originally requested, which was much more baritone. So I went with something that was higher pitched, but much more breathy and wispy. So we adapted it to something I could do. But Teba was a case where they gave me the description. I said, I know exactly what he sounds like in my head. I did it. They said, yep, that works for us. And we did it. And we, and that in the voice for the character. So that fulfillment of, of as an actor, producing a voice of your own volition with no input from the director prior to that and having them go, that is what we are going to use for this voiced character in this official launch day product for one of the biggest companies of the world. I can't even describe that feeling. That is, it, it, it's a full circle moment. It's a, you are good enough to do this for AAA companies making millions, if not close to billions of dollars a year and for them to trust you with bring that character to life for an English audience. That is amazing. <clears throat> so just to know, to let our fans know, um, how much of the Zelda series have you played over the years? Um, I missed out on a link to the past, although I guess since I played a link between worlds, I technically have dipped my toes into it because that was pretty much just a modernized port of a link to the past with, you sort know, of. Yeah, 
slightly different story, but you know, let's not kid ourselves. You know, it was it was a rehash. Um, but I played all of Ocarina of Time. I actually concerned my father because the night after I beat Ocarina of Time, I woke up sobbing because I was so pissed off at Navi for leaving Link. And my dad <laughs> thought I was sick or something. No, oh. I did. That was the legit reason. My dad thought I was like sick and throwing up or something. And I was trying to explain to him that this little pixie sprite left her best friend. And I was very upset at her for that. Um, you know, I played Majora's Mask all the way through. Um, Link's Awakening was the big one. Like I played Link's Awakening through to completion at least half a dozen times uh, in my childhood. I played a Link's Awakening DX when it came out on uh, the 3DS eShop, and of course I played uh, uh, Link's Awakening when it came out on Nintendo Switch, the HD remake. Um, so that, that one has been the most meaningful to me. Uh, I kind of fell off the boat around Twilight Princess, um, and that was just because of a mix of like college, like Smash right. Brothers was out at the time and I was really big on Smash Brothers. It was right around the time that my, my voiceover interest had started budding. So now all of a sudden this, this growing career interest was starting to eat up more of my, my free time versus playing video games in general. Um, so I, I started Twilight Princess, kind of fell off, completely avoided Skyward Sword. Um, and I don't mean to say avoided. I just mean it just didn't happen. It just was not in my repertoire. Right. Um, Hyrule Warriors I played pretty extensively when it first came out on the Wii U because that was really fun for me. I, I'm a big fan of Warriors games in general. Yeah. Um, and then I'm trying to think. Uh, what came after Warriors? Was it Breath of the Wild after Warriors or was there something else that came out between uh, them? There was... Um... Oh, Besides it? remakes, I'm talking about new games, not like Ocarina of Time 3D. But <laughs> oh, what's that one called on the 3DS? Not only Between Worlds, um, it's the one where you're three of them. I forget the name of it. Uh, Triforce Heroes. Triforce Heroes. Yeah, that's it. Okay, no, nah, I didn't end up playing Triforce Heroes, but I have played games that are in that same genre. So right. I, I'm not poo pooing it. It was probably a really fun game, but I've done that before. And if it was just the same type of game, but with Legend of Zelda theming, right. then I didn't really miss much. It's a, it's a hit or miss with a lot of fans. Um, it's really good if you got two people with 3DSs and a stable internet connection. Right. But if you right. don't, uh, as a solo, it's really, really lacking. Um, if See, I could uh, suggest that, a game, my version of that. Oh, go ahead. If I could suggest a Zelda for you, I noticed that you did not mention Minish Cap. Oh yeah, I've heard a lot of things about Minish Cap. Really good game. I believe if you still have a Wii U, you can download it on the eShop. Um, I th I don't know if it's on the 3DS eShop or not. Yeah, the Wii U is pretty much out of commission in this household. We've got the Switches set up. We've got the PS4. We have a Wii for like old old games but the wii u is pretty much done we're just done with it still got a 3ds uh i do it's, it hasn't been used in like two years you but see, i can yeah. charge it if you got one of the older model 3ds's that still play the the gba games then you can still uh i got a new nintendo 3ds xl so i don't think okay yeah well hopefully nintendo somewhere, will release somewhere it on in my desk Somewhere in my desk cubbies is, I believe, my original white Nintendo DS. Somewhere. Somewhere around here. I think I have the gold Zelda one, and I think I have a pink one. I don't know how mm. I got that pink one. Mm. I might have found it at a yard sale for like five bucks or something and said, okay, here you go. <laughs> there you go. I'm a collector. I, ha I literally have an entire room that's nothing but Zelda. Oh, my God. It's like every Amiibo clocks maps plushies i own a physical copy of every game right and it's crazy when i was a kid you know i played zelda and i always liked it but i was more of a mario guy and then when i became a teenager and ocarina of time came out it took over completely right ocarina of time was absolutely like my awakening as a zelda fan and I, I love I, a Link to the Past, and, and I still do. I, in fact, uh, I play a Link to the Past probably more than any Zelda game because it's right. such a quick game to get through. I can sit, I can, I can beat it in a setting at this point. Uh, but Ocarina of Time was definitely the game that was like, okay, I absolutely love this, and it's going to be my wife. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's um, it's a very mixed reaction sometimes when people 
reveal what games that got them into a series. I've heard so many over the years. And I can't believe we're actually getting to the point now where we're actually interacting with fans to be like, Skyward Sword was my first Zelda. And I'm like, um... Oh, gosh, Man, remember I'm... remember Sword Art Online? What an ancient anime. <laughs> yeah, we're there now. And since you mentioned anime, I know that you've uh, done some voice acting in a few animes. Why don't you tell the viewers that may not know what your other your other accomplishments are god man i don't even remember most of my anime roles like compared to my colleagues my portfolio of anime appearances is abysmal um and i haven't had a lot of luck with those roles either uh probably the the first big one that's actually persistent is guido mista in jojo's bizarre adventure golden wind um and I also I voice both him and all six of his bullets from his stand, uh, Sex Pistols slash Six Bullets, depending on which version you're watching. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've had an absolute blast with him. I really enjoy his mentality. I enjoy the challenge of doing each of the voices for the bullets. Um, excuse me. The other major one that people know me for is Subaru Natsuki in ReZero. Uh, but I don't get to talk about that very often because um, it's not – it's not uh, broadcast anywhere and no one watches it. So <laughs> I'm very proud of that role, but I've kind of already resigned myself to um, never having a chance to actually get into it because no one that I know has actually seen it. I don't think I've heard of that one either. I'm trying to. And that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to take a couple bookings in Japan and get to talk about that one. Uh, I think it's up on Crunchyroll now. It was off for a long time because of of, uh, contract issues when Crunchyroll and Funimation split when they weren't partnered anymore. Mm -hmm. But I do believe it's now back up and able to be viewed in its entirety. I don't even think you need an account anymore. I think it's one of those series you can watch for free. Oh, wow. I might have to check that out and uh, see see what it's about. Um, I'm going to take some – got some questions here that fans have sent in. Uh, we got about four or five of them here. Uh, the first one comes from Samuel Rogers. He is from the uh, the, Z- the Zelda Hub Facebook group. And he okay. asks, if you could voice any character in the history of Zelda that you have not already voiced, who would it be and why? Garahim. Garahim. I, I always have fun. Either either uh, uh, Garahim or Vati. Just because I have a lot of fun with characters that are very eccentric, that are very flamboyant. Uh, my original impression of Rivali was actually closer to his Japanese performance, which was that he was a performer that was trying to put on a show for Link in order to be condescending. Whereas the approach we obviously went for the English is no, he's confident because he put the work in and he has no proof that Link did, yet Link is considered his superior. So that was more of an authentic, down-to-earth, realistic uh, uh, bitterness of you know, I am I am allowed to be this confident because I put the work in. Um but Zenk from Fairy Fencer F is another big role that a lot of people point to when they say when they're pointing to some of my better performances because Zenk is just this bloodthirsty crazed psychopath and it's I consider it one of my best roles because the crazier I got the more unhinged I became the happier the director was and the more people enjoyed it so if I could play someone like Girahim who is like insanely loyal to uh Ganon to the point of of like uh, uh, drooling at the concept of working on his behalf. I feel like I could do that a lot of justice. You sure you don't want to voice Tangle? No. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> that's who I would want to do. If I was to ever get into voice See, that's, I don't want to take that job from you, man. Go, <laughs> go from your, follow your dreams. Uh, Tangle and Zant, that would be my two. I love... Mm. I like batshit crazy characters yeah just absolutely are out of it like the joker mark hamill my favorite voice actor of all time i love the joker from the animated series Mm, and that's how i've always viewed zant he is just this at first when you see him you think he's just this, this intimidating badass and then once you learn who he is and you're like oh no this dude's about every nugget short of his Happy Meal. Mm. <laughs> um, another question here. This one comes from, and forgive me if I butcher your name, Manuel Bargayos. 
two L's, I guess that's how you say that. And Manuel asks, what was your very first video game? Does it have to be Zelda? What got you into video games? Uh, what got me into video games? Yes. Uh, God, I don't know what got me into video games. Probably just, uh, we'd probably be getting into like a psychological aspect of, uh, who am I as a person? I'm entertained. I'm maybe more of a child cause I like, you know, bright colors and I really enjoy, you know, energetic personalities. So, you know, when I had a Nintendo entertainment system and a game like Super Mario Brothers two or Mega Man six, you know, it's, I kind of define my love of, of, um, chiptune music as well. Mm. Um, and it was just there since childhood. You know, I, I I was born at the perfect time for stuff like Sonic the Hedgehog and, and the Sega uh, Nintendo Wars, which meant they were always constantly trying to one-up each other with their video game qualities and their mascots. Um, it, pretty much the same way why you think of anyone who's an adult today is probably insanely addicted to Pokemon just because yeah. that's what they grew up with in their childhood. Um so it may seem like a really boring answer, but I, I want to say, like, my love of video games came from growing up in a time when they were super prominent. You know, I missed the whole era of Pong when it was just very basic um, uh, uh, computerized programs. Uh, but I imagine that people older than me who did grow up in that era probably have an extreme fondness for those types of games the way that I have an extreme fondness for for 8-bit games. If I have to venture a guess, I would say you were born around 90. Yep. Yes, yeah, I was born in 81, so I dealt, I had all the Atari 2600, all the basic stuff. Well, we had a right. Commodore 64, but I don't remember playing that one very much. It was no. my it was belonged to my younger brother. They got it at a yard sale. Oh shoot. And, and I, I I don't think we even had games for it. I think it was just there. <laughs> my mom i remember it what just my mom existed said. tempting like an emissary of darkness yes i remember something my mom said because my youngest brother was kind of coming into his own at the time as someone who is really smart with technology right and he still is to this day and i'm i'm i might as well just be a boomer because i'm i'm an idiot when it comes to anything technological so i go to him with all my questions but I remember what she said, and I remember laughing, because even I knew this was complete crap. She said, well, this is a computer, and we got it for your little brother, so don't bother it. It's how he's going to learn video video game programming. And I'm like, I just couldn't help but laugh. I got grounded, because I laughed at my mom for being, saying something really dumb. God bless her. Um <laughs> I just remember looking back at that and I'm thinking, Oh God, if I knew now, knew what I knew now, then I probably would have laughed even harder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Commodore 64, you and your, Oh yeah, that's right. Anyways. Um, uh, our next question comes from Emily stone. I okay. can't even read my own writing. Good Lord. I think that's right. She asks, dear chip, that's what she said, Chip. If you could take a Zelda character and put it into a television series and you get to voice that character, who would it be? Wolf Link. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, um, let me think. A character from any game, any game in the Zelda franchise that I can put onto an animated series and voice them? Yeah, the, the the series is like I guess would be revolved around them, right? Oh, I'm thinking back to all the characters I know from from Ocarina of Time, from Majora's Mask. He's too young for me, but if they made him a teenager, uh, Cafe from Majora's Mask, mm. I think is that the boy Majora's. Let yeah, me... the, the purple hair and the Pikachu mask. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I would want to voice Cafe. That's a good one. That's not one you really think about either when it comes to, like, how would you voice them or, or what kind of personality would you give them? Because well, I mean, he's already pretty much me. He uh, he likes fancy clothing. He uh, doesn't listen to adults very often, and he wants to marry a redhead. Hey, there's nothing wrong with redheads, my friend. You're, you're preaching to the choir there. There you go. 
And our last question here comes from Alexandra Wistoff from Michigan. And she wants to know, what are some other video games that you have worked on voice-wise? Oh, man. The video, if, the, um, if the anime sector is where my portfolio is abysmal, the video game sector is where I shine. Um, just scrolling down through my BTVA, we've got stuff like, I'm going to keep scrolling because I'm looking at all the anime stuff right now. We've got dungeon crawlers like Mary Skelter and uh, Zonky Zero Last Beginning. We've got games like Persona 5, where I voice Mishima Yuki. We've got The Legend of Heroes, Trails of Cold Steel, where I'm Reen Schwarzer and have been for the three games that were put out so far. Um, AI The Somnium Files, I voice Pewter. I'm in Pokemon Masters as Seabold and Nanu. Like, there's just way too many to name. There's, there's Mortal Kombat as Noob Saibot. Um, I'm on this mobile uh, uh, visual novel called Mr. Love Queen's Choice. Uh, I got to be in the HD remake of Secret of Mana. I was in East, Lacrimosa of Donna. Oh, it's, cool. Yeah, it, the list goes on and on. And video games continue to be one of the mediums of voiceover where I seem to find a lot of success. Uh, and although anime is very close to my heart, I am very excited about the potential to end up voicing in a game that I actually play nonstop. Um, so, you know, for example... Crystal Chronicles comes out really soon, and I'm really excited to hear, now that I know that there's going to be voiceover in it, I'm really excited to hear <laughs> if any of my colleagues made it into that game. Well, um, that's a game I'm very excited for, too. And, and I often tell people that my biggest goal would be if Etrian Odyssey comes to Switch and they choose to dub it again. They did dub uh, 4 and the uh, Etrian Untold games, but they stopped dubbing it when 5 and Nexus came out. But if it comes back on Switch, and if they dub it again... I would love to be a voice in Etrian Odyssey, even if it's just like a character voice type that you can like pick when you're creating your party members. Well, I hope you get to realize that accomplishment. That sounds like it'd be really fun. Mm -hmm. um, all right. That's all of the questions that we have this week. Um, do you have anything, any kind of projects or anything like that that you would like to plug and tell people about? What I tell people is, if I'm able to talk about it, I'm probably already talking about it on my Twitter. So you absolutely want to follow my Twitter, which is twitter.com slash sonicmega, S-O-N-I-C-M-E-G-A. That's also uh, the same username I use for my Twitch channel and pretty much everywhere else. Um, but if I am not talking about it, then I probably can't. And that's the worst part of this career. So the best way to find out about things as I'm allowed to announce them is to stay tuned on my Twitter. Um... And that's 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 really all I can say. But trust me, I'm a hype man. I love getting to talk about the things that I'm in, but I don't want to piss off my clients. So I'm going to wait until I'm allowed to. And I, I swear, as soon as I get permission to, that's the first place you'll find out about it. And for if you're wondering, everybody, I will include both his uh, Twitter handle and a link to his Twitch channel uh, underneath the comments on this video. That way you can find those real easily and be able to interact with Sean. Um, I have not checked out your Twitch channel yet, but that is on my list of to-do things. Uh, yeah. do, you have a, do you have a certain schedule you follow? Uh, I do. I, I, I attempt to do 5 p.m. Pacific time Thursday through Monday. Uh, right now we've got Thursday is Trials of Mana, Friday is Final Fantasy, Saturday is usually a specialty stream, like we've got a live dub playthrough of Undertale going on right now. Um, Sunday is typically my personal progress streams where I'll do like whatever game I want to be playing in the meantime, like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Um, and then Monday is a multiplayer thing Well, I'll do Jackbox or Smash Brothers or, or Competitive Uno. Um, and then as games get finished or as we decide to move on, we'll replace them with other things. But I do try to do it five days a week, Thursday to Monday, 5 p.m. Pacific. So when can we look forward to the uh, 900 Korok Challenge? Uh, pay me. <laughs> <laughs> ten, ten, uh, $100 per Korok seed. No, no, $10, $10 per Korok seed if I'm allowed to use a guide, $100 per Korok seed if I have to do it blind. Don't say that. I have been with Twitch for many years. I've seen crazier things happen. I know like a few months ago you did a you did an interview with the people over at Zelda Fine. Right. And that's basically that's their modus operandi. That's what You know they what do. I'd like to do? I will do I will pay Twitch 
$5 if they do a Twitch Plays Breath of the Wild, where it's Twitch chat controlling the character, and I will pay them $5 for every Korok seed they find. Oh, wow. Maybe maybe that's some kind of charity thing you guys could, could set up. That, that would be really fun to watch. <laughs> Twitch plays Cor- 900 Korok seeds. I can, like, I can, like, gift a sub or something every time someone finds a Korok seed. But but it's Twitch chat putting in all the controls, and they have to find the Korok seeds. I would watch that. That would be that would be absolutely hilarious. I would. I I can see it now, where all they have to do is get Link to pick up a rock, and he manages to roll himself off a cliff into the into the ocean below. I can see it happening. <laughs> Crashes right in front of a line. Or gets or better destroyed. yet, better yet, yeah, he'd roll off the cliff when all he has to do is pick up the rock. He'd land on top of a Bokoblin, killing it instantly, and then gets beat to death by the rest of the group. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> oh goodness sean you are absolutely an awesome person to talk to you're hilarious you got a great personality loved your work in zelda thank, thank you. you for everything thank you for giving life to three amazing characters i'm very grateful that i was given the opportunity and i'm even more grateful that my passion for those characters and for the franchise in general appears to have paid off in regards to the internet response. Yes, I I do have to say, uh, you are absolutely on point there. People have loved these characters and then the personality given. And I want to thank you for giving your time on this evening of June 6th, June 2nd, almost said 6th, way ahead of myself. And man, we might have to have you back someday in the future. Who knows what they're going to do with Breath of the Wild 2. We don't know yet. We've seen right. one little snippet of a, of a snippet. So hopefully you will, they'll get to bring you guys back for that. And we'll get to do this again here in a minute. In a for few sure. Months. I, I don't know if I'm going to be brought back for Breath of the Wild 2. Like, I legit don't know. My I've told people I don't see a reason why Revali or Teba should come back for Breath of the Wild 2 based on what we understand about the type of game atmosphere they're trying to create. However, um, if they come back, awesome. I hope they'll continue to use me. If they don't and they still want to do voice acting, I hope that I'll get a chance to read for other characters. Uh, but I will put forward that I know just as much as everyone else in the world right now. So please don't think I'm trying to withhold information. I, I'm I'm right there with you in the theater seat waiting to see what happens next. And it's an exciting time. Even though that we're dealing with all the things that we are in the world, we still have video games that we can fall back on. And we've got a Paper Mario coming up. We've got a Zelda coming up. We've got Metroid Prime 4 coming up, which I'm really looking forward to. Right. And it's a really, really good time to kind of immerse yourself in that and forget about your troubles for a little while and forget about the things that are going on in the world. Sean, I appreciate it, man. You've been awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you all are happy and safe. Keep playing Zelda. Keep playing video games. Everybody, thank you for watching. And good night.